session. So the reason why Ted starts the <laughs> sorry, session first is because uh, that's the creativity part of the music creation process. And when I usually get the songs from the artists, you know, that's, I have maybe songs that are 50% done, 80% done, or 100% done. And then that this is where I actually work the artists to either get more songs out of them, uh, work with what they have, maybe even if they have just one good chorus, we then maybe strip down a song and repeat them, uh, or, or write verses, write bridges for them. Um, also, one more thing is, you know, a lot of people, the ones that I work with, we go through maybe 12, 15 songs to pick out five good ones if you record an EP, or you know, up to 15, 20 songs before we record an album. And for most people that work their first single with me, I think the most important thing that you know, I try to get to them is write more songs, and then pick and choose your best ones, and you know, don't settle for, you know, I've got my first song and I want to put it out. I think, uh, especially working with a lot of Singapore artists, you know, everyone's very eager to put something out they can, and, and that's fine, that's a good attitude to have. But I think you, you really have to look through um, and write more to get out, you know, so-called the crap before you get to the good stuff. And when you write more, like, you know, using the, the uh, tips that Ted showed you guys, you, what, you, what will happen is you guys will really um, learn all the tips and tricks and know how to apply them better again. So that's one big tip that I really have to give a lot of ones, younger ones who are starting out. Or, you know, if you're a YouTube singer and you sing a lot of covers and then you want to write your own material, which is something I get a lot of requests of these days, a lot of YouTube uh, singers who are doing very well with covers, they you know, want to make the jump to original music, which is great. I think that's a good starting point because the vocal quality is there. But they don't understand that you know, being uh, a singer-songwriter means being a great singer and being a great songwriter. It's 100%, 100%. It's not you know fifty fifty and, and you, you make it up from there and you know like people like you know Jesse J and Ariana Grande they don't write the songs someone else writes it for them and you know someone like Ted actually writes it for them and then they just sing it and do a performance so a lot of the younger artists I work with in Singapore who want to bridge the gap you know not, not sing covers anymore you really have to get your songwriting uh, down I think that's the the biggest thing I've seen over the last year working in Singapore so we'll move on. Um, so like I said, this is the process of what happens if you're recording. Pre-production is really, really important. This is something a lot of people miss out, which is to actually do your demos. Uh, if you're a band, how many people are in a band here? Okay, only a few. Okay, that's fine. So if you're in a band, most important thing is to record every instrument you have live. You can use an iPhone, you can go to a jamming studio with um, a couple of mics, you know, multi-track recording. Make sure you get every part down, know what you're doing, know what every member is doing. And if you're a singer, it's uh, you're a singer-songwriter, easy. Acoustic guitar, piano, vocals, you're done. And that's really important. That gives you feedback to listen to what you've done, what you think can be better. Or if you work with a producer, arranger, any, anyone along the, the chain, gives them an idea of what you are about. Because sometimes people send me stuff, uh, it's really, really poorly recorded, or you know, they don't send me anything and expect to work with me. And I'm like, you need to send me something. And, and then they start getting really worried going, what do I actually send you? Because if they send me an iPhone recording, a lot of them feel that it's not good enough or they don't want to send me. Or they don't send me enough songs. Some people send me maybe three songs and then they don't know that uh, they have, they've got a great chorus in one of the 15 songs, but they don't like the verse or they don't like something. And they miss out. And, and you know, sometimes I have to prod and ask a lot and go, are you sure you don't have any other songs? And sometimes they'll relent, they'll give me three more or four more. Um, so like I said, it's really, really important to pre-prod everything, demo it out, and if you're working with someone like a producer or a, another co-writer, uh, arranger, mixer, whoever it is, recording studio, make sure you send them as much as you can. And if they don't want to take your demos, then probably not the right person to work with. Uh, for me, then I start, after I get the pre-production, I usually go in the recording studio with them or go to a jam studio with them, listen to the songs, uh, you know, tweak the arrangements, I'll listen to them and go, okay, look, this, this isn't working out, there's too much here, keep it simple. Uh, sometimes I do co-write, that happens on you know, one out of every three or four projects. And then we, then we go to the recording process, which is to record all the instruments as it is, all the vocals, all the backing vocals, all the ideas the bands have. And I think a lot of people don't understand how important post-production is. Uh, so that's where you, know, you can get everything from something good to great because you can tighten up everything, you can vocal line everything, you can uh, tune all the vocals, and, and that's something very, very important. I've heard a lot of stuff on, you know, info coming up from Singapore or other cu countries where the backing vocals aren't tuned well to the, the main vocals for those who are production-based. Uh, you know, if you're from SAE or you're from 
poly, you know, these are the things that you really need to look out for as a producer or if you're an artist and you're recording your backing vocals, they all have to sound, you know, tight and, and polished together. And then mixing is, is quite important because a, a mix often can make or break a song. Sometimes a song will have 16 to 24 tracks, sometimes a song will have 230 tracks. And getting that balance right, getting the message across, that, is, that requires a lot of skill from whoever you're hiring or whoever you're working with. And finally, mastering is also something that I think uh, working with a lot of Singapore artists, they sort of miss out the importance of having uh, someone good mastering their single EP or album. So moving on. So the typical mistakes um, I sort of work with a lot of artists, key and tempo. Uh, key, usually sometimes too low. If you're, you know, you, know they don't, you don't accentuate the best parts of your voice. Uh, tempo, tempo is really, really everything. You know, like you know, 60 BPM, that's your heart resting rate. 120, that's the typical um, uh, pop song kind of hit. And interestingly enough, today's tempo is 128 BPM. That's the hit tempo that we are facing these days. Can anyone tell me why? Yeah, why is it 128 BPM instead of 120? Pretty, pretty correct. The other reason is because we've been having too much caffeine. So a lot, of, a lot of us start, you know, needing to, our heart beats faster after years of Starbucks and uh, um, studying and mugging for exams. Uh, other issue I face is, you know, musicians who are very self-indulgent or they get their sessionist friends who play and, you know, they're, they're pulling a lot of notes and there's too much musicality and there aren't enough spots for them to showcase. So this is something that I think uh, if you have the mindset to pick your spots, you know, I'm not saying dumb down your musicality, I'm saying find the correct spots. No choice, song length. Like sometimes a, a band will come up to me and go, oh, this is a song, song we really want to put out as a single. And the, the song is five minutes, 30 seconds. And you're like, that's not going to happen. That's not a single length. A single length should be between, you know, three minutes to 4.30 tops. If you go to talk to any radio DJ, that's the recommended length. Uh, there's a reason for it, which, you know, you can Google why, and, and that used to be, vinyls, there's a history to it. There's also a, a modern theory to it, which is they, they got to get more content on radio and got to play more songs. Um, so and often, because people don't understand, you got to do pre-production or record yourselves or post-production is something a lot of people uh, I've worked with or I've seen, uh, you know, out with material and I speak to them or, you know, if they recorded somewhere else before and they're working with me and they go, oh, what's all these extra costs or what's all these extra things that we've never done with before? And that's something that, you know, not enough research has been done about what goes on in the process uh, and also not enough, not enough budgets and not budgeting enough. So the, the other thing that, you know, I think uh, Singapore lacks a lot in that sense is the process of A&Ring, which is very, very important. That's called artists and repertoire. So usually A&R is a division in a record company uh, with an executive, usually someone young, you know, mid-20s, 30s, who really understands uh, what the current market is. They talent scout, they find the artists, uh, they develop the artists, groom them, they know the market, they coordinate all the right studios, the right producers for the act, and they also help pick up the singles or single. This is something where, you know, a lot of artists I work with, they will tell me and go, oh, but Foo Fighters did this, or this band did this, Nirvana were big writing their own songs. What they fail to understand is actually that there's a whole A&R team behind that works with the band, picks the singles, and chooses a lot of these things for them and makes all these business decisions based on the songs they have. So this is actually a crucial part of uh, the business that is sorely lacking these days because uh, in our budgets are, are going down, people are getting fired, they're, they're the first uh, people to go in the company and there really isn't much of uh, departments in Singapore doing that. And this is also based on my experience speaking with a couple of labels in Singapore. There really, you know, not much of these things going on. So the next best thing to uh, an A&R in a label for Singapore is uh, finding the right producer because if your producer has a track record of making kits, the, their A&R input is quite valuable. Or you have a bis your manager would be a good option as well. So basically someone needs to do this with the artist or you have to do it yourself. It's an internal QNC, you know, QC process that isn't really available these days. So yeah, I'll, I'll run you through a couple of singles that um, I produced that we've made these kind of choices. So for, first of all, how many of you guys know General Bones or not? Have heard some stuff. Okay, so uh, he self-managed, I was his producer. Uh, we've done pretty well on, on a couple of Singapore charts. We've got three number ones in Singapore. And 
a lot of the ways we've done the song process is for him to send me three to five songs for the initial single until we die. So we went through, I think, three to five singles then. We had a discussion that was his best song by far that would appeal to his target audience the most, which is between 15 to 21. Uh, we also got you know, small focus groups, which is his friends, uh, which I'll explain why it's important. Um, and we specifically targeted iTunes market to get his number one first, because that is the only chart at the moment that looks trendy and looks you know, impactful to people's attention, to the press, to the media. Uh, there are other charts like you know, your 98.7, which are just important, and other radio stations, but you're also competing a lot with um, radio airplay from mainstream singles. Yeah, that's right. I don't think it's realistic to look at the 987 Top 20 as your benchmark for at first because uh, you're competing against Ariana and Jesse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whereas sales don't lie. Uh, if your iTunes sales numbers are up, uh, you, will look, you will get to a number one spot. And from what I heard, it's not that hard to get a number one spot, right? It's about between uh, 500 to about 1,000 sales to get a number one spot, depending how long it's going to last yeah. on, on, on stage. But that's impo on, on the um, side. But it's pretty important to get a number one hit because that's your gateway to getting played on radio. That's a gateway to getting uh, media attention. So I think it's quite important for you know, anyone who's here to fight for one. Can you just move down and see if there's any song? No, is it, no, is it uh, is it changed to another? It's just Ruby. Okay, well, yeah. okay. So, we, that's, like I said, we did three singles. The second one was a song called Elusive, and that was a different concept altogether. We chose that single because we actually tried to write an even more commercial song than Until We Die, and we felt that it didn't suit his needs as an artist, didn't suit his uh, image as an artist. So we actually already had gig testing with this song. A lot of people love the song, we got good response when he, when he was playing shows. People were requesting on his Instagram, going, please record this song. Uh, people, he did a live version of this song on YouTube, and people were requesting, please record this after Until We Die. So that makes sense. So the key thing is to get your first single out that re is strong, because that will help you your next se second single and your third single. And the third single, Save Me, was actually very difficult to choose, because uh, Joe's other favorite song on the EP, which is his favorite song, is called Settle Down and we had to choose between Save Me and Settle Down. And that was actually a business decision, and this is something that I think uh, a lot of young, young artists need to know. You have to sometimes separate yourself from what you like the most and what makes the most business sense. And this is why focus groups are important, because when we put it to the musician's crowd, everyone said Settle Down, including myself, including him. When we put it to all his friends who are non-listeners, I mean non-musicians, everyone picked Save Me, and then we decided, you know, look, this is the, what the market kind of is going for, let's pick that instead of something that we really want. So that's not even released as a single yet. So, and that's the favorite song of an artist. So those are the real you know, sacrifices or business decisions you have to think of when choosing a single. Okay, move yeah. Yeah. So next one, uh, recently with Warner Music artist Ruby, and it's a different process again. So Ruby has a very strong management company called Moat, and what happened was when we recorded the full-length album, which is 10 songs, all of us got through a voting process. Me, manager, Ruby, and uh, three producers were on this project that were in my team. So we all did a vote, and the ones that were the top two became the singles. And it's also very important that the first single was called My Sunshine, which is a reference to uh, the song You Are My Sunshine. So that, that was done with the specific intent of getting on Class 95, very, very commercial radio stations because it's familiar to art, a lot of people. And people were then bought into the voice rather than the song because they're already familiar with Sunshine. So that's something that is also important for um, you know, anyone to take note that sometimes the voice is just as important as the song and sometimes you're getting people to buy into the person's voice, not just the song. And using a song to make it, e like a, a well-known song to you know, entice them or like a cover. Okay, next one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add, since we have a bit of time, that uh, that is uh, one of uh, uh, James, uh, who is uh, Mode and who used to work at Warner, is someone that both Roland and I respect a lot. Uh, and uh, one, that's really one of the standard tricks in his playbook to do a half cover, i.e. a sample song. May, meaning take a chorus from something famous, turn it into something that's more contemporary for the needs of the radio sound of now, and then write a new song around it. So maybe different verses, different bridge, uh, but keep 
that song, that, which is especially strong when you are trying to introduce or reintroduce someone to the market, uh, so that they have something to latch onto that is bigger than the artist is at this point. I mean, hopefully in future, the artist will grow to be the main draw, like Beyonce or Ariana. But for now, like the fact that a song is recognizable off the bat, half your work is already done for you. So that is something that he does a lot. And also because it's about, you know, young artists that's emerging. So it's different from uh, a big artist with, who has a hit writer writing for them. So those are things to make, take note of. This is something which is difficult for a lot of, you know, artists to sort of accept. And, and it's not applicable for everyone as well, but it was a very, very good and legitimate choice because that single went number one on National Day. So. And lastly, from a band context, uh, band's choices are also a voting choice where everyone in the band and myself, we all contribute to the voting process. For, for, this, uh, for Make Them Suffer, for example, we also consulted the, the recording label and we also consulted the music video director who's a very close friend of the band who does all their videos for the last two years. Uh, why is it important to, if you hire a music video director? It's because you know, a lot of people spend too little money on, on production or too much money on, on video or too much money on, on, on music production and the video doesn't stand up to the music. So it's important to find a balance and important to consult. If you're doing a, a, a video, a music video, consult your director. Is this doable? Is this a good song? Does he feel inspired by it? I think that's also one key thing. Uh, you know, I've, I've definitely met a lot of music di video directors who take up jobs that they go, this song isn't even the best song on the album and we don't even know why the, the, the band or the artist put it out. So I think it's important to have conversations with all these people, depending on your situation, whether you're a singer, whether you're a singer-songwriter, whether you're a band, whether you're a producer, to consult a lot more people on those choices. So yeah, like I said, the, the key things, key takeaways for finding a single, it should be a well-represented well representation of the artist. So, you know, if you've got a 10-minute jam or like a post rock track, that's not going to be your single. Your single should be something that has great vocals, great melodies, great hooks like Ted mentioned. Uh, it should really be looked at commercial viability. You can't really play that it any other way. It has to be commercially viable. And also lastly, the most important thing is strate uh, strategy and se sequencing of the singles. So usually for an EP, you will pick two to three singles and usually for album, same, three singles as well. Uh, it's important to know how they line up and what are your reasons for picking one after the another, one after the other.